Uh, magandang araw sa ating lahat, mga kapatid, mga kaibigan, mga kababayan. Salamat sa Diyos at meron tayong pagkakataon upang muli magsama-sama at tayo ay makapag-aral sa kanyang mga salita. Napakaganda na kailangan natin tignan muli ang ating journey bilang mga anak ng Diyos upang sa ganun tayo ay matuto araw-araw dahil ang revelation naman ng ating Diyos ay palaging nandiyan at lagi tayong pupwedeng mag-connect at matuto muli. Gusto ko hong basahin natin ang isang passage na ito ay laging napaka gandang basahin kahit paulit-ulit at ito yung tinatawag natin Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28. Ano po? And I'll be reading from ESV. Ang sabi rito, Then God said, Okay, it is God who is speaking. Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. Verse 27, So God created man in His own image. In the image of God, He created him. Male and female, He created them. And in verse 28, And God blessed them. And God blessed them. And God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Blessed be the reading of God's word. Subukan natin iparse itong passage na ito. This passage tells us that God... created man but Adam and Eve in his own image in his own image ito po ay mahabang usapin but just for an introduction let's just simplify it if we jump to the book of John 1 John 4, 7 and 8 it says God is love And if God is love, and that image is love. And therefore, we are love. We are created in love and for love. It means humanity is love. And as we continue with this passage, he said, subdue, if you notice it, the whole earth. Subdue creation. Take dominion over all creation. Ano ho? Rule. In other translation, it says rule or take dominion. In our lingo, administer or govern or steward His creation. So if we just look at Genesis 1, 26 and 27, it says, It is God who created us, and He created us in His image, and if His image is love, then we are love. And the second part of the passage tells us that we need to rule, multiply, rule, take dominion, administer His creation. That's the big picture of Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28. It, it looks like this. He created us in His image. And if His image is love, then we are love. But if you look at Luke chapter 3, verse 38, and look at Adam, that's the genealogy, son of, son of, son of, son of, we see there that Adam, son of God. Adam, son of God. Therefore, the picture here is sonship. 
It means that we are sons and daughters and God is our Father. It means it is a family. It is a family because we have God as a Father and we as His sons and daughters. And as a family of God, we need to fill the earth, subdue it, or take dominion and then there would be blessing. If we look at the big picture of Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28, it is something that we can say it's like a paradise because here is a family filling the earth, multiplying over the, all the earth, taking dominion over all the earth, subduing all the earth, and God would bless us. It is a paradise. The picture is paradise. But as we look at the world today, it seems like we don't see or we don't enjoy or experience that paradise anymore. And we know what happened. Sin entered into the world and so forth and so on. But now we thank the Lord for coming. The Lord Jesus Christ came to redeem us back to the Father. And now we have this mandate of subduing the earth again. Or to make it short, subduing our nation, the Philippines, our regions or our province, our municipality, our barangay, our community, or even our family. In short, in the lingo of Christianity, this is our ministry. So let me summarize. We have to become love so that we can minister and it would be a wonderful community. But the question is, as we look around us, it seems like the world is becoming wicked and wicked every day. In spite of the many engagements that we are doing as believers, we still get to see wickedness flourishing around us. Even if we don't get that far, even within the body of Christ, within the community of believers, we still see wickedness flourishing. In spite of the many engagements, in spite of the many uh, ministries, in spite of the many sacrifices, in spite of the many commitments that we've given, we still see wickedness flourishing. Time and time again, we would dream of having a community that is transformed to the point that we, we, we say, and it is true, that the Philippines is for Christ, our province is for Christ, our, our city is for Christ, our community is for Christ. But if we would just be on the ground, still, wickedness is flourishing. And so at this point in time, I would encourage you that we take a look at what is happening around us, and not only around us, but even in our own community as believers of Christ. And I, and I want you to journey with me with this question, why is the world so wicked? Why is the world so wicked? And that we need to identify the root cause or root causes why the world is so wicked. It was the moment we are able to identify the root cause of a problem, then we can come up with the right answer. It's like if we are able to identify the bull's eye, then we are able to aim our arrow so we can hit the bull's eye. Because if we are not able to identify the root cause of a problem, even though we will pour out many solutions at the end of the day, the problem will still be there and it will grow again because the root cause has never been answered. And so let us join it together in trying to identify the root cause why the world is so wicked. So let me put it this way. Why is the world so wicked? Let's just focus our discussion with this question. Because our aim, let me repeat this, 
is the moment we are able to identify the root cause of a problem, then we can also come up with the right answer. Okay? All right. So let's continue with this. I put here Yahweh, God, the Triune God. I won't discuss so much about Him, about the attribute of God or Yahweh, because most of us, we know, we know a lot already. But let me identify just one. He is an all-sufficient God. He is an all-sufficient God, meaning He doesn't need anything to smile. He doesn't need anything to be complete. He is complete by Himself. He doesn't need something for him to stand up. He is complete by himself. He doesn't need any reason, any reasoning for him to live. He is complete by himself. However, as we read the scriptures, there are many things that he opted. I will use this word. Because he did a lot that we don't know the full extent of his reason. Sometimes he would tell us just a brief reason. But most of the time, there are so many things he did that we cannot really understand the full aspect why he did some things. That's why I use this word, he opted. And all sufficient God opted to create the heavens. And then, he opted to create the earth. Okay? And all sufficient God, he is complete by himself, opted to create the heavens. Then later on, he created the earth. And when he created the heavens, he created beings. He created beings. When I say beings, a being has life. A being has a form. A being can communicate. A being can move. A being has certain degree of emotions. That's a being. Buhay. A dog is a being. A bird is a being. That is a being. And when he created beings in the heavens, in my journey as a pastor's kid and given the opportunity to go through the seminary for so many years and have been uh, a student to many conferences and seminars, if you ask me, what are the beings in the heavens, I would only have two simple answers. One is Yahweh, the triune God, and the angels. That's my very simple understanding prior to this revelation. But when this revelation came and I started to read the scriptures, especially when you read it in its Hebrew form, you begin to understand that there are a lot of beings in the heavens. Let me give you some of them, just a few. I won't, I won't uh, discuss them all. One is Ruwa. You get to see Ruwa in, the, in many passages in the scriptures. But one particular passage that we can see is in 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 19 to 22. That's the... Uh, passage regarding Ahab, the northern kingdom, and Jehoshaphat, the southern kingdom, when Ahab wanted to uh, invite Jehoshaphat for, for them whether to go to Ramoth Gilead and, and, and take that land. That's, that's the picture. And if you notice, in that conversation, you get to see uh, Jehoshaphat telling Ahab, well, let's seek God. Let's inquire God. Do, do you have any prophets? And Ahab said, yeah, I got a lot of prophets. And when Ahab started to invite his prophets, 
Si Jehoshaphat po, may be diskumpiado siya. He said, wala ka bang ibang other prophet? Yeah, I have I, another prophet, but, uh, but I hate him. I don't like him because he doesn't tell good things about me. So to make the long story short, Micaiah was invited. And when Micaiah started to share to Ahab and Jehoshaphat what he saw in the heavens, the discussion in the heavens, you get to see the heavenly host together with Yahweh conversing or discussing about the fate of Ahab. Actually, they already decided the fate of Ahab, but how would they implement their decision? And in that conversation, you get to see a spirit came forward, a spirit spoke, a spirit volunteered. And if you read the Hebrew rendition, you get to see Ruah. The spirit there in English is Ruah in Hebrew. So that's a being. And there are a lot more. There are, I guess, around 400 instances wherein you see Ruah in the scriptures. Okay? Another is we have Samayim. Samayim. In English, it is translated heavenly ones. You heavenly ones. You get to read that in Psalm 89. Heavenly ones. Samayim is also a being. Because you get to see Samayim in the uh, presence of the Most High. You get to see Samayim discussing. You get to see Samayim speaking and moving. So Samayim is a being. Another is Kedosim. Kedosim. Again, you get to see Kedokim, Kedosim surrounding the throne of Yahweh. Discussing, speaking, moving, even shouting at times. Another is Kokebim. Especially in Job 38, when Yahweh, when God was creating the earth, Kokebim, they were there to the point that they even shouted when, when they saw Father God creating humanity. They shouted. And a lot more. So let me just put this, etc. So again, Yahweh, who is an all-sufficient God, He opted to create the heavens. And when He created the heavens, He created beings. And when he created beings, he created a lot of them. Why? Because the Hebrew writers would describe other beings as ruah. So in other uh, writings, they would describe these beings as samayim, kedosim, kokebim, etc., etc. Et now, the very fact that the biblical writers describe the heavenly beings in different words. It means that they are not all the same. It means they have different nature. Because look at this. The writers of the scriptures, when they see or uh, have an experience in the spiritual realm or a story is told to them regarding the spiritual realm, they will use words familiar to them to describe that experience or that story. The fact that they describe these beings in different names, it means they have different nature. They have different nature. To make the long story short, and dami palang beings that Father God created in the heavens. Nandiyan pa yung cherubim, seraphim, giborim, a lot more. Let me repeat that. The fact that the writers of the scriptures describe them with different names, it means they are not all the same. They are all heavenly beings. They are all spirit beings. But there is certain degree of differences because their description by the writers of the scriptures are not the same. They describe a spirit being as ruah. They describe another spirit being as Samayim. 
they describe another spirit being as kedosim. They describe another spirit being as kokebim, and so forth and so on. For now, let me just tell you that the spirit beings created by Yahweh in the heavens, they have different nature. They also have different hierarchy, but I will not take that today. But they are all in the scriptures. They have different hierarchy. They also have different functions. I will not also take that today. But let me just give you some uh, tips in advance. Sometimes they are called watchers. Sometimes they are called ministers. Some of them are called hosts. Host meaning they are in a military formation. Some of them are mediators, not for salvation, but for messages. Some are worshippers. Some are guardians. They have different function. So if you look at now the beings created by Father God, it's so huge, it's so vast. A lot of them with different nature, with different hierarchy, and with different functions. But there is one general description the time and time again, we get to see how they are being described. These beings. They are called Bene Elohim in Hebrew. Bene Elohim in English. Sons of God. Sons of God. Benay Elohim. In Job chapter 38, you get to see there. And in many, many instances, Benay Elohim, Benay Elohim. The heavenly hosts, as they, they are described as Benay Elohim. Sons of God, sons of God. Now, let me bring you back again to what I said earlier. The writers of the scriptures, the biblical writers, they will use words familiar to them to describe what they are experiencing, to describe whatever is being told unto them. Now, the fact that the writers of the scriptures describe these beings as sons of God, most likely, they saw the relationship of these beings and Yahweh. They saw them, or they heard their relationship, their dynamics, how they relate with one another, and they said, oh, they must be sons. Because what Yahweh is doing to them is fathering them. Because they know what a father is, they know what a son is. Because the writers of the scriptures are human beings. Maybe they are family men too. They know what a father will do to a son. They know the reaction of a son. They know how a son would speak. They know how a son would... In interact. And so when they saw the relationship of these beings to Yahweh, or it has been told unto them the relationship or the dynamics or the interaction of these beings to Yahweh, ah, they describe them as sons. These are sons of God, meaning Yahweh is a father unto them. Yahweh is a father unto them because they are described as sons of God. Bene Elohim, it is in the scriptures over and over again. Our manual will give you the passages. Bene Elohim, Bene Elohim, Bene Elohim, time and time again, they are sons of God. Now, most of us are fathers or mothers. What would be the natural tendencies of a father or a mother to their children, to their sons and to their daughters. The natural tendency is to impart whatever they have. Now, if they have been together, father and son, for eons of years, we don't know how long, how much intelligence kaya ang inimpart ni Father sa kanila? How much intelligence have Father imparted unto them? What I want to say is, they are intelligent beings. 
but they are not omniscient. Only Yahweh is omniscient. But they are intelligent beings. Compared unto us, their intelligence is far, far beyond. Because they were even there when Father God was create, creating us. They know the Philippines more than us. Because they were present. Their intelligence is far, far beyond than us. But they are not omniscient. Only Yahweh is omniscient. But because He is a Father unto them, He imparted them. He imparted unto them to a certain degree some intelligence. What else? He is a creator, the creator. And therefore, they can be creative. They are not creators, but they can be creative. And therefore, their creativity is far, far beyond than us. Because they've been with Father God for eons of years. There is a reason why I am emphasizing this so much. Their creativity is far, far beyond than us. But they are not creators. They are creative. Only Yahweh is the creator. What else? Maybe they have learned from Yahweh how to wield power. How to wield power. Therefore, they can wield power far, far beyond than us. But they are not omnipotent. Only Yahweh is omnipotent. They are not omnipotent, but they can wield power far, far beyond than us. Because they are Bene Elohim. They are sons of God. And as I said, the tendency of a father to a son is to teach a son. That's why you, many times you say, father like son, mother like daughter. Because that's the tendency. Again, the fact that the writers of the scriptures describe these beings as sons of God, then a Elohim, then Yahweh is a father unto them, and he taught them many things. Remember that. But there is another category of beings in the heavens that we are so familiar with. Malakim. In English, angels. However, Malakim is not a proper noun. Malakim is not a proper noun. It is a job description, meaning messenger. Messenger. When you send somebody for a certain task, you are sending a messenger. That is an angel. It is not a proper noun. It is a job description. Malakim, malak, is a job description. So if you look at the heavens now, in a summary, there are three categories. The highest would be Yahweh, the triune God. Another category would be the sons of God, Bene Elohim in this, the Hebrew, Bene Elohim, sons of God. And another would be the Malakim, the angels, the Malakim. However, Father God can also send the sons of God, the Bene Elohim, to do a certain tasks. And if they are sent by Father God, the Bene Elohim, to do a certain task, because Malakim is a job description, they are also called angels in that certain task. They are doing something. They are doing something. Okay? Because Yahweh can send the Bene Elohim, the sons of God, to do a certain task because they have certain function. When they do that, they are also called angels. That's why in our English translation, many times, they are translated as angels. But if you look at their Hebrew, you get to see it's either Ruah, it's either Samayim, it's either Kedusim, it's either Kokebim, and so forth and so on that is being sent to do a certain task. Okay? I'm emphasizing this so much because it has something to do with our question, why is the world so wicked? Okay. When Yahweh and also efficient God opted to create the heavens, He created beings. 
And when He created the earth, He also created beings. Ang tawag niyan ay Adam. By the way, Adam is not a proper noun. Adam means dust. Adam means dirt. In short, Adam means humanity. Sangkatauhan. Adam means humanity. But for the sake of our study, syempre, sama na rin natin si Eve in this discussion. Meaning humanity. Humanity, beings. The difference is this. The beings created by Father God in the heavens, yes, they have a form, but they don't have a physical body that we can touch, that we can bite. They don't have. And so for the sake of our discussion, allow me to use, when every time I speak of beings here on earth, I will use the term bodied beings. Kasi may katawan eh. Bodied beings. And when I describe the beings in the heavens, allow me to use the term unembodied beings. Wala kasing katawan, but they have a form. They also have a form, but they don't have a body. So unembodied beings and bodied beings. And if you look at Luke chapter 3, verse 38, because the whole chapter of Luke chapter 3 is a genealogy of son of, son of, son of, son of, son of. And when you hit verse 38, Adam, son of God. Son of God. Anak. Anak. Adam, son of God. Shortcut tayo. What can you notice with this big picture, when Yahweh opted to create the heavens, He created beings. He opted to create the earth, He created beings. And when and these beings, the writers of the scriptures describe them as sons of God. And Adam, all humanity, sons of God. What can you observe? He created a family. He created a family. He created a family. Now the question is, how can the dynamics of a family be experienced if some of them are unembodied, some of the members of the family are bodied? How? That is where we get to see Father God brought humanity in the Garden of Eden. Eden. But this is a one whole day topic again. So let me just telegraph the message. We'll take that in another discussion. Eden is where the blended family of God would mingle together including Him. That's why in Eden, Yahweh is here. Right? If you get to read the scriptures, the conversation of Adam and Eve to Yahweh is there. And there's also Nakash. I'll just use that. Nakash. Now, tatanong kayo ho, bakit if God is a holy God, how come the enemy can enter Eden, which is a holy ground. That's our understanding. But now, we begin to understand that Nakash is more likely part of this. Okay. Satan, in Hebrew, is nakash. And there are three different ways how the writers of the scriptures would use nakash. First, if they use the word nakash or Satan as a noun, 
it means that Satan is an animal, part of the animal kingdom. If the writer of the scriptures in his mind is using Nakash as a noun. But there is another usage of the word Nakash. If you use it as a verb, if a writer would use the same word Nakash as a verb, it means adversary. Kaaway. It means adversary. Kaaway. And if the writer of the scriptures in his mind is using the word Nakash, the same word, but the word Nakash as an adverb or an adjective, adjective, it means bronzed or shining one. Shining one. Now, when Satan was in the garden deceiving Eve, and of course together with Adam, sinuho kaya siya? To give clarity on this, we need to jump to the book of Isaiah and Ezekiel and see how the writers of the scriptures, especially Isaiah and Ezekiel, would describe Nakash. And if you jump to Ezekiel and Isaiah, you get to see Nakash being described by the writers of the scriptures as someone who is full of glory, someone who is full of splendor, someone who is shining, someone who is full of wisdom. But there's a twist. You don't see somebody that, is in, that, that belongs to the animal kingdom. Isaiah and Ezekiel never used Nakash as a noun, as a part of the animal kingdom. But they describe Satan, they describe Nakash as someone who is full of wisdom, full of splendor, with gems, shining one. And because of this, we can deduce that most likely, Nakash is part of these beings. And that's the reason why he can enter a holy ground, which is the Garden of Eden, because that is where the sons of God, unembodied and bodied ones, would come together. Unfortunately, he carries a rebellious spirit. Parang sa pamilya natin, maybe you have five children, they are all your children, two girls and three boys maybe. But one of them is rebellious. Yes, he can still come home. But of course, as a father, you put a certain limitation because you know that he's a rebellious son. The same thing here. The same thing here. Now, why am I laying down all of this? And what is the connection with our question, why is the world so wicked? It is like this. In my journey, all throughout my Christian life, every time I would see wickedness, every time I would see poverty, every time I would see sufferings, I would always say, if only Adam and Eve did not sin in the Garden of Eden, we would still be enjoying the paradise that Father God started in Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28. What do I mean? To me, the root cause why the world is wicked that is Genesis 3. And that is true. However, I would only point out that it is all because Adam and Eve sinned. That's just my understanding why the world is wicked. And it is true. And therefore, my answer is, I need to disciple the Adams of the earth. As a minister, I need to bring them back to God 
through the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's true. And disciple them to become a better Christian, to become a mature Christian. And that's true. And we should keep on doing that. However, with this understanding, I see another root cause that we need to address. And what is that? The rebellious son. The rebellious son. What is the role of the rebellious son? When it comes to why is the world so wicked? It is like this. For example, we have a seven-year-old boy. You have a seven-year-old son. Seven-year-old son. And you also have a, let's say, 27-year-old son. That the gap is long. The gap is wide. Seven-year-old son and a 27-year-old son. One day, your 27-year-old son invited your 7-year-old son to go out and just have some fun. And they ended up in a bar. And they stayed there overnight. Maybe drinking, singing some songs, just enjoying the night. Eat some wine here and left and, and right. And then early morning, they came back. They came back. And when they came back, you as a father or you as a parent, what will you do? Of course, it's called them. Both of them sinned. But let me ask you, between the two, where would your anger would be focused more? Yes, you'll still be angry with the seven-year-old because you would say to the seven-year-old, why did you go there? Why did you go with your brother? But common sense will tell us that your finger will be pointed more on the 27 years old. Why? He knows your values. He knows what is good and right. He knows more than the seven-year-old. So what am I saying? Yes, we still need to disciple the Adams. One. This should also be, this should, this should continue as our ministry. But we also need to address the rebellious son. We need to address the rebellious son. Why? We have this mindset or worldview when it comes to transforming our community, transforming our city, transforming our nation. We have this perspective that if only we could bring all the Adams who are lost in our community to the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's good, and then disciple them to become mature Christians, and that's good. And then we have this hope that we would have a better community. Yes, maybe. But let me show you. Granted, granted, every human being in your community came to know the Lord. And you've, and we've discipled them to become the mature Christian that we wanted them to be. Granted, they've reached that point wherein their holiness is like Adam and Eve before the fall. They would reach that maturity of holiness like Adam and Eve before the fall. Let me ask you this question. Hindi na kaya sila madisip ulit? What happened in Genesis 3 will give you the answer. I'm not saying that pursuing holiness is wrong. What I'm saying is, there is another focus that we need to add to what we're doing. And that is, we need to understand how to address the sons of God, particularly 
the rebellious sons of God. The rebellious sons of God. These are not the spirits that we cast out every day. They are sons of God. I told you earlier, their intelligence is far, far beyond than us. Their creativity is far, far beyond than us. Their wielding power is far, far beyond us, than us, and many more. And many more. If you look at how they deceive Eve, look at their intelligence. Anong sabi nila? You will be like God. Right? The moment you eat from the tree, you'll be like God. Now, if you've been Adam and Eve, and you've encountered Father God, and you've experienced His love, you've experienced His embrace, you've experienced His eyes and everything, who wouldn't want to be like Him? Kumisang nga, di ba yan ang message natin? Let's be like God, let's be like Christ. Parang, yan yung offer ni Nakash. Look at their intelligence. It's far, far beyond than us. It's far, far beyond than us. And so what I'm saying is, yes, let's continue discipling Adam's humanity. But that is not enough for us to experience a transformed community or a paradise community or a better community. We need to know how to address the rebellious sons of God. These are sons of God. They are not the spirits that we cast out every day. They are not. They are different. They are sons of God who are far, far more intelligent than us, are far, far more creative than us, who are far, far more can yield power more than us. That they can even deceive even the holiest human beings created on the face of the earth. Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve. Kuminsan, we have this mindset as long as banal tayo, as long as okay tayo, ang kaaway ay hindi tayo kayang impluensyahan. That's our mindset. Again, let me tell you this. I'm not saying that pursuing holiness is wrong. No, let's go for it. But what I'm not saying is, that is not enough. That is not enough. Even if you are able to create a very holy place like the Garden of Eden, yes, that is good. Let's go for it. But that is not enough. That is not enough. Because in Genesis 3, Nakash was able to deceive the holiest people on the face of the earth in the holiest place on the face of the earth. But my good news is, there is a way in the scriptures how to address the rebellious sons of God. There is a way. There is a way. At yan po, ang ating ipagpapatuloy na pag-aaralan